sacred masculinity and femininity. There have been a lot of misunderstandings about sacred masculinity and femininity circling around the internet lately. Some are saying they don't exist at all and we must throw them out, while others are oversimplifying the two into what they perceive to be traditional gender roles. Like most things in polytheism and the esoteric, it ain't that simple. The forebears of paganism didn't have to fit into the duality imposed by later Christian colonizers. They were free to explore, express, and ponder their ontological existence. Of course, they had a duty to the greater community, but they weren't the struggling survivalists that revisionist reactionaries have painted them into. So let's go over some history. Practices. Many spiritual practices required either engaging in sacred feminine or masculine energies. Ontology is the study of being, a Greek term. Basically, when you're categorizing abstract spiritual concepts, you are engaging in ontology. It's not a hard science, or even a soft science for that matter. There are no measurable attributes, only speculation fully informed by historical sources, citing UPG when necessary. I've heard some individuals refer to sacred feminine as Wiccan. No, it's an ontological descriptor. Specificity of language is important to convey meaning. Sather. Many heathens are familiar with the term. They misspell it as Seder because, despite me mentioning in countless videos, we still translate the letter F into a D. It's a TH represented by the rune Thursas. According to Jakob Grimm of the Grimm's Brothers, Sather may be an etymological precursor to seething a possible attribute of the ecstasis involved in the art. Sather requires engaging in the sacred feminine. Odin himself famously practiced Sather, and we actually have artifacts depicting him in femme garb, something he learned from the goddess Freya. Some terms were Volva, meaning wand woman, Seith Kona, Sather wife, Fulkoning Kona, full cunning wife, or knowledgeable woman, and even Homhlepia, Hummer leaper, shape or skin changer, as Sather encompasses a lot of what we'd call witchcraft today. Often, the cunning person or witch is really the local herbalist, apothecary, doctor, etc., and in that scope were many magical practices, a commonality amongst many cultures before modern medicine. Sather was one of three attested practices, along with spa, type of orlog manipulating divination, referenced in Philospa, and Galder a more masculine art of singing the runes. A quote from Tacitus, Germania chapter 8. They believe that there resides in woman an element of holiness and a gift of prophecy, and so they do not scorn to ask their advice or lightly disregard their replies. In the reign of the Emperor Vespasian, we saw Velida, long honored by many Germans as a divinity, and even earlier they showed similar reference for Orinia and a number of others, a reference untainted by servile flattery or any pretense of turning women into goddesses. As we know from TV, all Romans sound British. As you can see, a clear attribute is assigned to the sacral femmes amongst them. Men who participated in Sather or Spa were said to have dressed in feminine garb and possibly endured negative reputations for engaging in a feminine practice. However, this may be the bias of Christian scribes. We do not know for sure. What we do know is that Sather and Spa were very important and useful to the arch heathens. So why would someone learning magic and utilizing talents to help their people be ridiculed for it? We see clearly negative connotations assigned to magical practices, yet traveling Volar were treated well. One term for magic in Old Norse is trolldom, literally assigning the negative label troll to magical practices. Personally, I believe this to be the bias of Christian authors. And as we'll see amongst other cultures, it is not unusual to be femme or mask regardless of body parts. As for masculine practices, amongst the arch heathens, we find the term Dringer, which I actually wrote a book on. My version of Drangskopper is, of course, updated for the modern era, but in the Old Norse, Dringer meant something like badass or warrior, and was considered a standard for men. Post Christianization, the term Dranger has evolved to mean young man, depending on what language you're referring to, showing that it has lost its former meaning for many modern Scandinavians. But like Sather, Dranger was a term that was fluid. While men had to be Dranger, women who embodied more warrior-like traits could be called Dranger. 
The 13th century Icelandic tale, Njal's Saga, or the story of Burnt Njal, describes events between 960 and 1020, relatively, and includes two female drengir. Badass women could also be called Skorum. Bergthora, specifically, is described as drengir. Lagerther, popularly known by her Latin name Lagertha, was one woman whomst took up masculine roles. Saxo Grammaticus, in the early 13th century CE Gesto de Norum, described her thusly. A skilled Amazon warrior who, though a maiden, had the courage of a man and fought in front among the bravest with her hair loose over her shoulders, all marveled at her matchless deeds, for her locks lying down her back betrayed that she was a woman. Not exactly the perma-camping tradwives manosphere alpha bros like to see. To the archheathens, while many did fall into some traditional roles, it wasn't the harsh standards we've come to expect. What we consider traditional gender roles vary from culture to culture, era to era, depending on the needs, perception, and technology of the people and time in question. Amazon appearance that Saxo is referencing likely comes from Scythian warrior women, a culture that interacted with Greece. These two were people of practicality, not strict social lines. They were one of many steppe cultures, often horse riders and raiders, and the fairly patriarchal Greeks viewed them with a certain disdain, hence the Amazons becoming villains in their stories. I go over this more in my Scothi video. The Scythians, according to Greek historian Herodotus, had soothsayers called Anare, singular Anari. This may come from a Greek word Aneria, meaning unmanly, as some Anare were said to be femme males. Keep in mind, of course, our only source for this is the Greeks, who colored everything in their patriarchal lens and perspective. The Anare not only presented as femme, but were also said to be followers of Aphrodite. As Aphrodite is a cognate of Freya, goddess of love, beauty, and lust, we see another similarity to Sather. As I'm a Norse pagan, that's more my scope of understanding. We see a lot of vilification of female will workers in myth, lore, and history. I'm not certain of many other direct sources outside of the Norse that explicitly state magic is connected to the sacred feminine. No, Wicca does doesn't count, it's actually modern, but many depictions of female villains are magicians. While the term mage comes from a combination of the Zoroastrian Persian magi and Greek goes, characters like Circe in the Odyssey are fairly common. When I do my Ingrid Botha video, currently being researched, I will get more in depth on the vilification of witches. I should also mention the Spartans. The movie 300 was wildly off base. The Lycodemon state was a fairly masculine ideal, descended mythologically from a son of Zeus named Lycodemon. Sparta is known for its warriors, but unlike what the movie preaches, they promoted homosexuality amongst the warrior cast, like a lot of Greeks. Nothing says, I'll die for you in the phalanx, like getting busy crossing Xephos after dark. Unfortunately, the Spartan state was also highly authoritarian, over-regulating the lives of citizens, which led to married couples having little time to procreate. Also, they were the most heavily armored in Greece. Sorry, no oiled up spray on abs to strike fear in the hearts of your enemies. Only the hard steel of hoplite abs. Also, Zoroastrian Persia was a far freer society at the time. Sparta had a slave economy, as the state currency was worthless iron due to the corruption gold brings, and Zoroastrians don't believe in enslaving people. So, with this information, I now expect my audience to giggle like schoolgirls when seeing someone's 1776 tattoo next to a Spartan and Lambda and crossed Zepho's swords. Oh, the irony. Don't believe everything you see in the movies, kids, especially when getting permanent marks on your body. Do your research. Divine Gender. The Divine Feminine and Masculine take on many forms. There are no one or two templates for us to emulate. Bragi, god of skalds who gained apotheosis, is not a fighter like Thor. In fact, Loki points this out while dishing out insults in Lokasena. Skadi isn't a dainty flower by any means, yet we know she's called Underdis, snowshoe goddess. Deseer being a particular type of femme ancestor known to protect, much like the idea of a guardian angel. The Vanadis, Dis of the Vanir, Freya, is seen more like the soft feminine goddess that may come to mind. I personally imagine her with flowing red hair. 
but I'm a little biased. One of Freya's sacred animals is the falcon. We know this because of her falcon cloak. People focus on her cats a lot, but the falcon was the bird of kings, particularly the female of the species, as she is the larger and better hunter, unlike her schmo male counterpart. Lady falcons were preferred by nobles when hunting via falconry. Falcons are known for their speed and knife-like wings. They're often confused with hawks, but the cheek stripe and tominal tooth are a dead giveaway. The falcon was also revered by the Kemetics. Note the cheek stripe on Horus and Khonsu. Again, this was the bird of kings, and they're closer in relation to parrots than hawks or eagles. The epitome of masculinity in the Norse would have to be Thor. Swole, brash, and wielding the most phallic weapon possible. No gentle swordplay for the Thunderer, only smash. Odin is also regarded as masculine, being the god of kings and berserker. But in Grimnismal, we find out the flaw of the extreme in either gender energy. Odin raises one boy to be hyper-masculine. He grows up to be an asshole. And Frigg raises a boy to be hyper-femme. He turns into a complete quivering puss illanimous, showing a need for balance. Too much of one ignores the other and creates flaws. It also shows us the archheathens knew we had both within us. I'm reminded of the scene in Showdown in Little Tokyo where Brandon Lee and Dolph Lundgren are talking about martial arts training. Brandon's character says, Did you have to do that flower arranging stuff? And Dolph responds, A warrior who knows only one side leaves himself vulnerable to attack. What about other pantheons? The world doesn't exist in separate culture vacuums, and humanity was spread far and wide, many different perspectives. So what were those perspectives? In Egypt, we see Ra, the sun god, a possible cognate of sky fathers, as he was central to creation, and sometimes pantheons depict their sky father as a sun god. But there's one thing that the public is often not told about Ra. He is actually all genders. More specifically, Atum, an earlier solar god, was all genders. They birthed themselves from the chaotic waters of Nun, then both impregnated themselves and gave birth to all the things, not unlike the Vedic Brahma. Kemetic theology is more soft polytheist, believing all gods come from one. Thus, all genders start from the source. So, as we're seeing, gender has never truly been a strict binary. More like two energies existing within us at different levels. Another Kemetic god, referred to as he, is Hopi, the god of the Nile floods that Egypt relied on. He was depicted with feminine breasts and a pregnant belly. The Egyptians believed the father put the fetus into the mother. It's giving reverse seahorse. A clear fertility god a masculine figure with feminine features. In China, the Buddhist Bodhisattva Kuan Yin, a goddess of mercy, used to be male. Valokiteshvara, her male origin in India, became Guan Yin in China, either due to Taoist philosophy's emphasis on the feminine, or maybe even the Western influence of the Virgin Mary. Guan Yin went from being a male god to being a female god, making her a literal trans goddess. Tiamat, a cognate of Ymir, is the primordial chaos dragon in Babylonian mythology. She is often regarded as female, but in the Anuma Elish, Tiamat is referred to as both femme and mask pronouns. Tiamat is a personification of saltwater who mixes with Apsu, the personification of freshwater. This mixing brings about creation. This may also allude to why we don't see Ymir have a maternal partner, and why the Jotnar seem to simply spawn from him, often with water-like qualities, like his sweat for example. I should also note that it shows how shallow and vapid Jordan Peterson's understanding of the Dragon of Chaos really is. Once you actually research the mythology he often references, you realize he's barely got wiki-level knowledge of these subjects. Two cups. Here's my personal theory on how gender functions, based on all this history as well as my personal observations. If you disagree, lemon know why. It's better to discuss and learn. Without the understandings of others, we will never grow. It's not a scale, per se. It's more like two cups. Every one of us has these two wells within us, metaphorical wells of masculine and feminine energies. The masculine and feminine symbols are the Spear of Mars and the Mirror of Venus, hence the shapes, more reflections of our understanding of gender through divinity. Some people have more water in the masculine cup, while others more in the feminine. Some are relatively equal, 
give or take, and others may have an extreme of one or the other, often, but not always, creating an imbalanced personality. Toxic gender traits often enforce stereotypical norms out of fear. A confident person doesn't give a fuck. But an insecure masculine may nitpick tiny perceived femme traits. Likewise, a toxic feminine person will judge other femmes for not doing femininity the exact way they would do it. Like judging a tired, stressed out mom for not having a Leave it to Beaver picturesque home. If you don't know who Leave it to Beaver is, ask your parents. Part of this comes from moralizing gender. Men are taught that feminine characteristics are weak and immoral. That a person with perceived feminine traits, especially a male, is a coward and cannot defend others should the need arise. But logically, this is fallacious. A hyper femme person can easily have indomitable fighting skills in any martial talent. A limp wrist does not equal a weak punch or glass jaw. Think about the mama bear. Nobody wants to fuck with a mama bear because they know she's defending her cubs with a mother's fury. Inversely, a burly dude bro may only look tough on the outside. We have certain preconceived notions about who people are based on their outward appearance, but that isn't necessarily related to their value and abilities as a person. I deployed with a couple marines who were swole strong dudes, but when they would wrestle or do McMap, they had no idea how to use that strength. On the toxic femme side, we may want to judge a woman for an unkempt house or not being girl boss enough. People need rest. People get stressed out. We don't know every intimate detail of a person's life. Maybe they have a mask partner who doesn't help out. Maybe they're busy chasing a toddler around, more worried about pressing responsibilities than the aesthetic of their home. You just don't know, so don't judge. Trad wives are a special kind of toxic feminine. The lifestyle is based on a hatred of the capitalist rat race. They don't want the stress of a job or to have to step on other people to get ahead in the workplace. Totally legit concerns. And there's nothing wrong with making the choice to stay at home and take care of home base. The key word being choice. Toxic girl bosses will have the inverse venomous take, that women must engage in the rat race, not understanding that the very systems they're engaging in are the systems of oppression they're supposedly against. Get your f***ing ass up and work. It seems like nobody wants to work these days. You don't fix the problem by making the problem stronger. Both trad wives and girl bosses are engaging in toxic femininity. They have different boxes for you to fit into. Trad wives are sick of the consumerist systems, despite usually being more than willing to get on their knees and lick the shoe polish clean from that very establishment. And girl bosses are engaging in the toxic masculine traits they're supposedly against. I'm strawmanning a bit to highlight extremes, but you'll notice this through line amongst both these extreme mentalities. And before my conclusion, I'll make a statement about toxic masculinity as well. For equality's sake, toxic masculinity, like toxic femininity, stems from fear. Fear. It's what happens when a man is afraid he's not mask enough. Often, this is learned from another toxic man or men in their lives. Not helping around the house because you're the lion of the pride, or thinking women must be subservient because that's just nature. Hell, not helping with your own offspring because that's lady work. Exploiting the labor of their femme partners, then wondering why their love life is in peril. All these things, and many more, come from a place of fear. A strong man is confident in his masculinity. Confident enough that he doesn't need to put others down. And caring enough to actually help his partner around the house. Whatever that help looks like, is up to the people in the relationship. But talking about it with your significant other and seeing what their needs are is very important. And we tend not to teach our boys these lessons. Likewise, if a man stays at home and does all the domestic tasks, whilst the woman is off and getting that bag like a lioness, he's not less masculine for it. Again, it all comes down to personal choice. And as long as something isn't harmful, who cares what people decide to do? Conclusion. This video is already way longer than I originally intended, so I'll try to be brief. We can see the wide varieties that people come in, the choices we make, the lives we live, the person you want to be compared to who you are now. So much diversity exists within the human diaspora. The only real concern we should have is consent. 
freedom of choice. If you want to live in a society that values liberty, then that's all that matters. One thing people forget, as the philosophy of rugged individualism permeates today's society, is that we all have different strengths and weaknesses. Our ancestors survived based on communal strengths. The blacksmith doesn't have to weave. The weaver doesn't have to go build homes. They each have their strengths. Likewise, masculinity and femininity are different from person to person, depending on the needs of that person's job, hobbies, passions, etc. Masculinity looks different to the CEO than it does to the carpenter. Femininity looks different to the fitness instructor and the fashionista. All are valid. You are valid. The only thing that matters is consent. Are you consenting to being who you are? Are you allowed to be your true self? And in matters of love and lust, as long as that's consensual, it doesn't matter. Love who you want, lust for who you want. As long as everyone involved has agreed freely and without coercion, it's all good. Some people are too concerned with what's under your kilt when it's none of their damn business. Some people think that two mask or two femme people holding hands in public means that they have to explain dynamics to a child. Why? Betty and Velma holding hands is no different than Fred and Wilma. You don't have to bust out an overhead projector with slides of the birds and the bees. For that matter, mask or femme people wanting to dress or be called what they want is also just freedom. All these people rocking the don't tread on me are saying, except we can tread on people we disagree with. Do you want a country of freedom and liberty or not? Think about it. In closing, we are our deeds, not what's under our kilts or who we choose to be romantic with. Our actions speak more for who we are and the quality of our character than how we choose to present ourselves to the world. A confident person knows who they are and doesn't have to put others down to feel better. Score!